Palo alau mari hau eiki mo le lei ai tonga kotoa pe fia fia ke tar talele mo tolo he tau faka eke eke koe ni pe mo e faiongongo ko ia ai TV no si la ko Papua Jiva ai ko e faiongongo ni ai Pacific. We're very very blessed and, and very very excited to be joined this evening by Barbara Jiva, who is the Pacific correspondent, a very experienced Pacific correspondent um, for TVNZ, and uh, she joins us now on the line from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Barb, thank you so much for giving up your time. Malo le lei. Malo le lei. Uh, but we were talking a little bit earlier uh, with regards to Tonga. I know you've had some mm. conversations with um, Peter Lund from the New Zealand High Commission in Tonga, as well as some communications mm. with the company responsible for the cable in uh, Tonga. Could you give us a little bit of an update of what the situation is in terms of our international communication with Tonga and how long it looks that we might not be able to contact family back home? Yes, and that's certainly the thing that um, everyone wants answers to. People are so desperate. Yes, that's um, certainly the thing that everyone um, is looking for answers for, isn't it? And I'm really sorry to say it's not looking like great news. It's going to be at least two weeks um, before international communications, that's internet and phones, um, are working. The only thing that's working out of Tonga at the moment is um, satellite phones, and only a couple of, um, you, just the high commissions really have those. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's pretty dire, and I know families are so desperately wanting answers and hoping to find that their loved ones are safe. What's going to happen with the um, fixing of this, um, this cable, which runs from Tonga to Fiji, and it runs under, it's more, more than 800 kilometres long, and it runs un, under the, on the seabed, um, and it is cut, severed in a couple of places. And so what... Uh, Tonga cabling is going to be doing um, is, is trying to fix it. One of the problems is one of the breaks is very close to the volcano. Um, so what's going to happen is that the, the vessel which will do the repairs is based in Papua New Guinea at the moment. That will leave Papua New Guinea in three or to four days because it takes time. They have to get that boat fully ready and prepared um, with all the equipment on board. It's then going to Samoa to get more urgent equipment. And the reason why it has to go to Samoa is they have to make sure they have every single bit of equipment on board because once they get there, they can't come back, right? They've just got to fix it. They have to make sure everything's on board and then they head out to the sites. Um, it's going to take less than a week for them to fix that, but that's only if nothing goes wrong. Um, and you can imagine, you know, being so close to that volcano, there could be more eruptions. In fact, volcanologists are predicting that. Um, and there's real health and safety issues. There could be ash falls. And the cable, which sort of sits on the seabed, um, could be have buried itself under um, because of those um, the, the explosions. Um, so they don't really know what they're going to find. And so when they say two weeks, um, I think that might be a little bit optimistic. But um, we're hoping that it's that you know it's even before that because people are desperate for news. And um, I know that there's been some reports coming through the news in terms of um, not casualties, but at this point, thank God, but certainly in terms of missing people. Now, there's a couple that um, ran, run a or ran a, uh, a tattooing shop there in Nukalofa. They're, they're originally from, from England, is my understanding. Um, I know you spoke to the brother of, um, of this, one of the members of this couple. Could you give a little bit of an insight into what happened with regards to this couple? Yes, um, what, what happened was that uh, they had um, gone back. Angela Glover runs a, um, also runs a, looks after the dogs, a dog rescue on the island. And they went um, back to get to rescue some of their dogs. Um, it was on the waterfront. And um, that was when the, the waves struck and her husband, James, managed to grab onto a tree, but she was swept away with the dogs and she is still missing. Um, one of our reporters did speak with um, her brother who's based in um, Australia. And he said that they're losing hope. You know, they're, they know that things are going to be pretty, it'll be a real miracle if she's found. So really tragic there. He's actually going to fly to England to be with their mother. Um, there's a t different, she's definitely, you know, there's a different Tongan connection 
um, there as well. So it's it's a very sad um, sad situation for this family. Very well liked couple. Um, I've been reading the post to the for them, and uh, people just you know they they're really well liked, good people. Um, so particularly heartbreaking for James Glover. I mean, yeah, it's, it's tragic. Definitely. In terms of um, damage to infrastructure, I understand that um, you've been in contact with Peter Lund and he's done a, a bit of a, a surveillance drive through the main streets of Nukalofa and along the waterfront there. Um, what's the report in terms of the state or of the of damage that he's observed in terms of infrastructure? Um, he was quite surprised that um, a lot of the buildings were still standing. I think there's a lot of damage, though. Um, but it appears that he he also said that it, it, uh, when he the buildings he drove past we don't know exactly where that was um, seemed to be intact um, but you know we've all seen the footage we we do know that um, there is damage but hopefully it's damage that can be fixed um, you know the damage that can't be fixed of course is um, people and um, the impact on on people's lives and and also you know infrastructure is, is a big thing power water um, and I, I guess that's the big um, threat at the moment is water supply how prepared is Tonga for a tsunami of this magnitude in terms of their uh uh, emergency response. I know that there's that Australia and New Zealand are on standby to provide some level of assistance. Yeah. How prepared is Tonga for a disaster of this magnitude? You know, um, Tonga's been through quite a lot of disasters, as we know. There was Cyclone Gita, and when I was covering that, what really surprised me was how quickly everything swung into action. Um, even just even with the winds were dying down, you know, the, the emergency services were picking up the pieces straight away. Red Cross was on the ground going door to door, checking on people. Um, so I've no doubt that that's happening. But when you, the problem that we've got is that we don't know actually how it's all swinging into action, who's hurt, who's, you know, the, the, what what's needed. Um, I suspect that Tonga being Tonga will be doing the, doing the very resilient and will just be going for it and, and helping as many people as they can. But, um, you know, water supply is such a big deal. If it's contaminated, we already know there's been massive ash falls in, uh, in, on Tonga Tapu and many of the outer islands. Now, if that water is contaminated, which it will be, what are they going to do? And um, how prepared are they? Um, they knew that this had been bubbling along. We, we knew that several days before Saturday last week, um, the National Emergency Management Office had been out delivering water to some of the smaller islands that dot around Nukualofa um, and, and giving people water. But so we do know that that had already swung into action, which is great. Do they have the um, resourcing um, to deal with something on this magnitude? We, we, we just don't know. Now, I understand that New Zealand uh, Defence has sent an aircraft to Tonga today for some level of, of surveillance, and I know the Australian Defence Force has done similar. Um, have you heard any report as to the outcome of that surveillance? No, and we're waiting with bated breath. We're, that flight should be coming in around about now, um, and it will take some time before we have access to the footage and photos. This is all very crucial information for Tongan authorities, who, of course, can get a real visual on, on what the New Zealand and Australian Air Force have collected. Um, because, you know, some of the, the islands, they're, they're still out of touch, not being able to get phone connection connectivity with. So this is one way they can have a look at the aerials and get have an assessment of the damage. It also is good for, um, it gives New Zealand an idea on how much money that we, you know, and resourcing that needs to go straight to Tonga. Um, and also aid agencies. I've been speaking with a few aid agencies they're they're poised and ready for you know to get in, but how? <laughs> because they're frustrated by the lack of communication, and of course borders being closed with COVID. Um, that that's another issue. Will the Tongan government allow aid agencies um, and people from the outside to come in when the border? 
borders have been closed for so long to protect, um, quite rightly protect the Tongan people. I mean, we, we still, you know, we have COVID here, yet Australia, very, even more so. So that's an issue as well that, that has to be addressed. And it's, it's, these are not normal times. And, and I guess that's what makes it so scary for, for those um, at home who are just waiting and hoping for news from Tonga. Have you had any update in terms of how far the tsunami waters actually went in terms of downtown Nukualofa or even perhaps further along the coastline? We did hear some reports online that the Otuhaka Beach Resort and some of the other resorts may have um, had some significant damage. Yeah. We heard reports that the area of Sopo was more damaged than the other side. Uh, have you got any idea of sort of the geography and how far waters went? Yeah, we don't. We don't actually know. Like, we're just picking up snippets of information. Um, I do know that the resorts were, um, as you say, damaged. Um, uh, in fact, I hear uh, some have been, like, really wiped out. Um, so, yeah, that, that's one thing. But we don't actually know how far the water, and we're, we're trying to piece it together from um, what we got before um, communications were cut. So, yeah, uh, I do know in 2013, though, um, a group of uh, scientists from the um, South Pacific community had spent two years looking at the threat of tsunamis to Nukualofa. And they had analysed data from the seabed and from the shoreline to look at how um, Tonga, how Nukualofa would fare in a tsunami. And it was based on an 8.7 earthquake. And they found that the um, first wave would come in from the east, from around the harbour, and then the second wave would be even higher, and it would hit the town area, the inner in 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 town area, and that it would pretty much cover most of Nikolov, and there'd only be four points which would be above water. Now, what happened on Saturday was a le took much lesser degree than, than that scenario. But it, it was pretty accurate um, in terms of the water, where the water came in. Um, so yeah, it, it's, it's pretty accurate. So we're all hoping, because here's the issue, is that they're saying that there's going to be more, more eruptions. Uh, volcanologists, um, we heard from several volcanologists tonight, they're predicting that there will be more eruptions, very likely. And and when you have more eruptions, you have the threat of more tsunamis. So that is a real worry for everybody that we just don't want to see the types of scenarios that was predicted. I mean, Saturdays was bad enough. We don't want any more than that. And my understanding is that the, I mean, the seismic technologies or the tsunami warning technology is, is more developed along the lines of, of based on earthquake activity. This is a little bit different in the sense that we're dealing with a, with a volcano and the volcano is not only, it's going, it's not like an earthquake, it's almost like a one-off event followed by tremors, but this the volcano is still very, very active. And I'm wondering whether there was even sufficient time between the uh, discharge of, of the debris from the volcano and the warning to people in terms of a tsunami. I know that um, TVNZ caught up with Mary Fonua from the Matangi Tonga publication, and, uh, and I believe she mentioned about roughly 15 minutes between hearing a big bang and, um, and waves starting to come into Nukualofa. Yes, that's right. I mean, the volcanologists I've spoken to didn't think that there would be a tsunami associated with that. Um, and they were surprised Surprised when there was one. But um, it was interesting, the police down, I have a friend on Wuna Road, um, down the um, other end where, um, of, by the palace, that, that sort of end, and they got warnings from the police about, probably about, well, in a good time, good amount of time for them to evac jump in the car and evacuate. Um, and I was speaking to her and she was filming as she was going and um, she's saying, yeah, we've been told to evacuate and time to go now, people. And she did put out a warning as well um, for other Tongans who might be other people who might see that post, get out now, move now. But not everyone um, heard those warnings. And um, yeah, and maybe they didn't understand what was going to happen anyway. It was so fast. It was a fast event. Um, and that's the reality of um, a tsunami. One would hope that, you know, the alarms would, the tsunami um, alarms would have gone off. Um, um, so yeah, that's something that needs to be looked at in the future. 
you set that alarm off and everyone knows to go, not dependent on a police car coming past saying, go now. Uh, this is not the first time, Barb, as we both know that Tonga's internet system's been offline in terms of yeah. um, cuts to the to the cable system. And um, I'm not too, I'm not across technology in terms of what other options are available, but um, it'll be interesting to see what learnings we take away from this, particularly if there's going to be more eruptions after the network does come back online and, and potential future damage to the cable. Um, and besides that as well, we, we know that there is that satellite telephone technology, but um, I've been um, understanding that it has very limited capacity and if I'm not mistaken we do know the Australian High Commission and the New Zealand High Commission have access to this kind of technology but it's not a, a broad public avail publicly available network so where do you think we stand in terms of technology and communication you know from what we've learned from the last time this happened to now and moving forward? Well I'm really surprised that you know, there, there, there weren't measures put in place to deal with this kind of scenario because, I mean, it was a ship's anchor which broke or severed the internet um, uh, uh, tunnel the, the last time. So you would have thought that measures were put in place. And while it is important for government and um, emergency officials, that of course has to take priority, that has to be the first port of call. I mean, my understanding was there's going to be some sort of satellite dish put in place for the people. So to enable the people to be able to use that. And it shouldn't just be for, I mean, we're seeing this evolve now. There, there are thousands of families who are desperate for news from their loved ones and can't get it. You know, the, the 81 year old father the, the, who lives on his own and they don't, he's in the on the waterfront area and they, they're desperate for, so crying out for help and information. That really in this day and age, like should that have happened? Um, I, you know, you'd want to know that there was a backup plan, um, especially after that scenario, which really wasn't that long ago. And they were without um, power and, and uh, sorry, not power, they were without the internet and also um, international lines for a good 11 to 12 days. And they didn't have the complication of a uh, volcano <laughs> so yeah i'd, I'd want to see um definitely there should be more satellite phones um they're not that expensive um they're expensive but you know maybe that's something that aid agencies could look at um or governments could look at making sure that the right people have um satellite phones that should be the bare minimum I know that the couple that we talked about a little bit earlier from the tattoo mm -hmm. shop were obviously expats who, who live in Tonga. Um, have you got any update in terms of accountability for New Zealand citizens that are on the ground in Tonga, whether they're permanent residents there or temporary residents? Um, no, um, we understand that um, the Kiwis are fine, but um, again, we're sort of relying on, certainly it would have been um, Report given to us, that information would have been given to us. There are over 50 Kiwis in Tonga at the moment. Um, and as I understand it, none of them are missing. Um, there is one other person um, that we know is missing, but we don't know who that is or indeed whereabouts um, that person resided. Um, but I suspect that there could well be more people missing. We, It's you know, it's it's complicated. We just can't find that information out. And some of the communities, while the, I understand that local phones are working, um, you know, a lot of there are communities that don't have that. So, yeah, we'll be finding out more as the days um, evolve. But my, I think my, you know, my heart breaks actually for. Um, families who are just so worried for their loved ones back home I think it must be it just it's unbearable and um, I know you've done many trips to Tonga and reported from Tonga many times mm -hmm. over over the, over the years um, before we finish is there anything you want to add in terms of information that you have available you'd like to get out to our Tongan community more broadly around the, our global village or is there anything you want to share personally in terms of um, this disaster and its impact on Tonga as someone who's reported from many disaster zones and also had the opportunity to work from Tonga over many many years? Um, well from um, a professional perspective first of all I think that um, 
that there are systems that have been put into place and I'm hoping that they are um, working. I also know that um, our, you know, we've got a New Zealand Air Force Hercules, which is um, all stocked up and it's ready to go tomorrow with supplies if it can land at um, the airport. Um, and we don't know what sort of state the runway is in. Also, um, our Navy ship is going to depart as soon as possible, even though Tonga hasn't officially requested New Zealand's help, um, Navy help. Um, our guys are going to head out on the out there because it will take a few days to get there, so they want to make sure they're poised and um, ready to assist. Um, so I, I think that there is help, going to be a lot of help available for Tonga. Um, I think that these are testing times for the new prime minister. I mean, it was only a few days ago that he was sworn in and a, a sort of a new type, or not sworn, you know, the opening of parliament, right? Um, and a new government. And wow, I mean, what a test um, for him as the, as a new leader in these incredibly um, stressful and hard times. It's going to be a true test of his leadership. So I think that's something we're all um, waiting to, to, to see how that evolves. Um, but, you know, as speaking as someone who I, I have um, Tongan um, nieces and nephews, I have, um, I love Tonga. It's one of my most favourite places in the world. It's, it really grips your heart and just takes you along with it. Um, it's a place that I care deeply about and I'm not Tongan. Um, so um, you know, it's been particularly, I find it really um, heartbreaking and I just hope that I know how strong Tongans are and resilient and I'm, I really believe that a lot of prayers um, and hope and just that resiliency, um, Tonga will literally rise again from the ashes. That's awesome. Look, thank you so much, Barbara Drew, for your time, for joining us today. I know our Tongan people really, really appreciate those updates. We're just so um, screaming for information right now. And that, that update you yeah. provided today is really, really appreciated. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Malo o pito.